Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in the eastern park in the palace of Megara's mother. Then the Brahmin Ganaka Mogalano went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in this palace of Megara's mother, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is, down to the last step of the staircase. Among these Brahmins, too, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is, in study. Among archers, too, there can be seen gradual training, gradual practice, and gradual progress. That is, in archery. And also among accountants, like us. We earn our living by accountancy. There can be seen gradual training, gradual pra practice, and gradual progress. That, too, is in computation. For when we get an apprentice, first we make them count one one, two twos, three threes, four fours, five fives. And we make him count to a hundred, two. Now, is it also possible, Master Gotama, to describe gradual training, gradual pra practice, and gradual progress in the Dhamma and discipline? It is possible, Brahman, to descri describe gradual training, gradual pra practice, and gradual progress in this Dhamma. Just as Brahman, when a clever horse trainer obtains a fine thoroughbred colt, he first makes it get used to wearing a bit. Afterwards, he trains him further. So, too, when the Tathagata obtains a person to be tamed, he first disciplines him thus. Monk, uh, come, monk, be virtuous. Restrained with the restraint of the Padimokha. Be perfect in conduct and resort, and seeing fear in the slightest fault. Trained by undertaking the training precepts. The Padimokha is the rules of the monks. You have eight precepts to keep. I have 227. There's a lot of subtle little things that most laymen don't realize that that we're keeping our precepts by acting in particular ways. <coughs> when Brahman, the monk, is virtuous and seeing fear in the slightest fault, trains by undertaining undertaking the training precepts. Then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, guard the doors of your sense faculties. On seeing a form with the eye, do not grasp at its signs and features. What does that mean? Don't grasp at the signs and features. Hmm? No clinging, yeah. Actually, this uh, do not grasp means do not cling. What does clinging mean? When you have a, a, a beautiful sight, what do you start thinking about? And then you start thinking about something else and you forget forget where you are and what you're doing and you get caught up in your thoughts. 
So when you cling to the signs and features, that can be a major distraction. Now the word grasping here, or uh, grasp, implies craving and clinging both. What's craving? Tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. It's the I like it, I don't like it mind when a feeling arises. Clinging is all of your ideas, opinions, concepts about why you like or dislike it. And clinging also has the major belief that all of these thoughts are yours and you take them very personally. Since if you were to leave the eye faculty unguarded, evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade you. What are unwholesome states? Come on. Huh? The biggest unwholesome state is taking all of your thoughts and opinions and concepts personally. That is the most unwholesome. Okay, it's, and the hindrances are part of that, of course, but the hindrances are where that personality belief is stored. So, how do you overcome this problem? You use, you use right effort, 6R. One of the biggest mistakes that most people that are teaching today that I've run across is that they don't follow right effort. They do part of it and then forget the rest. See, the thing is, if you're, if you're noting something until it goes away, you're not replacing that with something wholesome. Or if you are replacing it with something wholesome, you're bringing that ego belief to that wholesome thing, which makes it unwholesome. I rather insist that you smile a lot, all the time. Why? Because it improves your mindfulness. It's just that simple. What is mindfulness? This is one of the major questions with, quote, secular Buddhism. You can ask them what it is, and they don't know. Mindfulness means to be mindful. Can you use a definition like that? Doesn't work. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Observing how mind moves. This is really key. Because when you observe how mind's attention moves, you're seeing that everything that arises is a part of a process. And what is that process? Say it. Dependent origination. So when you are truly mindful, you're seeing that things are arising and passing away and there is no personal self involved with it. So the more you smile, the lighter your mind becomes the lighter your mind becomes, 
the more you experience joy. And when you experience joy, your mind is bright, your mind is clear, your mind is your mindfulness is very quick. You're starting to see how the process works. So smiling, which is never encouraged by most people that practice meditation, because you're supposed to be serious with this stuff. You have to try hard. Now, I've been to a lot of meditation retreats. And I've seen so many people with these deep lines in their, in their forehead while they're meditating. Do you think they're using a joyful approach to the meditation? I used to go up and tap people. Cut that out. Don't do that anymore. When somebody is trying too hard, their mind has a tendency to become restless. And then you get very much caught up in your thinking and dreaming about this or that. And then you think, oh, I'm, so, I'm not supposed to do that. And you try to force your mind away from that hindrance. Everything that the Buddha teaches is about opening up and relaxing. Everything. When you have restlessness and you try to force the restlessness away, who doesn't like the restlessness? Who wants it to be different than it actually is? Who wants to control that restlessness? Or anger, or lust, or sloth and torpor, or doubt. It doesn't matter which one it is. The more you get involved in trying to think your feelings, the more suffering you experience. Made up of five things, right? You have a physical body, you have feeling. Feeling is not emotion. Feeling is simply pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. You have perception. Perception is a part of your mind that names things. This is orange. Perception is a part of your mind that says, this is orange. You have formations, thoughts, and you have consciousness. When restlessness arises or any painful feeling, the first thing your mind tries to do is think the feeling away. The more you think the feeling, the bigger the suffering becomes. So we need to realize that when I'm talking about six R's, I'm talking about right effort. There's a paradox in uh, Buddhism. And if you want to let go of, con or if you want to control things, what you actually have to do is let go of the control. Because you're not in control anyway. You don't ask these feelings to come up. You don't sit there and say, well, I haven't been depressed today. I might as well be depressed. Nobody's going to do that to themselves. That feeling arises, that tightness I am that, that the, the 
thoughts and opinions and ideas. It's the verbalization in your mind about that feeling and how you don't want it to be there and how you want it to go away. Then you get into your habitual <coughs> tendency. Habitual tendency is where emotions arise. And the more you try to control the habitual tendency with your thoughts, the more you suffer. So what do we do with that? What can we do with that? There's a real simple, easy thing. It's so simple that when people hear about it, they say, it can't be that easy. There's no way. Things have to be complicated. We have to use our mind to crush mind. It doesn't work. Why? Because I'm there. I am that. Craving. The more you get involved with trying to control your thoughts and your feelings, the more easily you suffer. The more you get involved with your suffering, the more pain you cause yourself. So, <coughs> the unwholesome states can become wholesome when you change your perspective. When you change your ideas. When you let go of the identifying with these weird little thoughts that come up and the pain that comes up, and the anxiety that comes up. All of those you're taking for yourself. This is me. This is mine. This is who I am. I'm suffering, and I don't like it. I, 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 I. Every time I arises, that means there is craving. How do you let go of craving? By using the relaxed step. By letting go of that tension and tightness. The six R's are real easy to remember. That's why we call them the six R's. You recognize that your mind is distracted. You release the distraction by not keeping your attention on that. You relax the tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. Now, one of the things that people don't really realize is that the brain is part of your body. Isn't that profound? Your head is part of your body. And in a lot of the suttas, the Buddha said, be mindful of your body. And what that means to most of the people is from the neck down, be mindful of the body. Not realizing that this is part of your body too. So, there is a membrane that goes around the brain. It's called the meninges. Every time you have a thought, every time a feeling arises, every time there is a sensation, the meninges contracts. That is how you can recognize craving in your mind. By that tension and tightness. It's not big, it's subtle. 
most people that are practicing meditation. They don't see that tightness. As a result, they go off of the Buddha's path because they're not following the instructions in right effort. They're not recognizing that tension and tightness. A lot of people, they wind up developing absorption concentration. The Buddha never, never taught absorption concentration. What the Buddha taught was tranquil wisdom insight meditation. Twim. When you relax that tension and tightness in your mind, in your brain, you feel an expansion that happens. And right after that, you'll notice that you don't have any thoughts. You don't have any distractions. Your mind is clear. Your mind is bright, alert, and it is pure. Why is it pure? Because you don't have any craving in your mind. And that is the third noble truth the cessation of suffering. Now, you bring this mind back to your object of meditation, but first you need to start having a wholesome mind. And that means Smile. An awful lot of people are told over and over and over again at, at monasteries all over Asia, life is suffering and you should see that suffering. Well, that's kind of a wrong translation. Life isn't suffering all the time. There's joy and happiness in there. That's not suffering. There is suffering in life. You don't have to be a genius to understand that. Everybody knows it. That sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's not. So the more you can realize and practice that relaxed step, the easier it is to let go of the suffering. What's the cause of suffering? Craving. What is craving? How does it manifest? How do you recognize it? It manifests as tension and tightness in your mind in your brain. Now an interesting thing is when you let go of that tension and tightness in your brain, you let go of tension and tightness in your mind. Mind and body are interconnected, right? So you let go of tension and tightness of one of them, they both lose their tension and tightness. That's how you purify your mind. You bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. You bring that clear, bright mind that's pure back to your object of meditation. Now, a lot of people, when they're practicing meditation, the instructions are similar to this. They're not always going to be exactly the same, but this happens often enough that I can give you the example. Your mind is on your object of meditation, gets distracted. Let go of the distraction, immediately come back to your object of meditation. 
What are you doing when you practice that way? When you immediately come back to your object of meditation, I don't care if it's the breath or loving kindness, what, whatever your object of meditation happens to be, you're bringing craving back to your mind. You're not recognizing that craving at all. Over a period of time of doing that kind of practice, absorption, concentration, the force of the concentration will eventually suppress, stop the hindrances from arising, which is all good and well while you're sitting. But when you lose that deep concentration and go back into your daily life, what happens? There's no real personality change. There's no personality development. You're still caught up in the same kind of anger you had before you started meditating. You still get caught up in the same kind of predicaments. You haven't learned how to purify your mind because you haven't let go of craving. And craving is a biggie. There's, there's suttas here that talk about the way you overcome all kinds of suffering is by letting go of craving and ignorance. Ignorance, not understanding how the Four Noble Truths actually work. So it's a real important aspect of the practice to be able to see this little tension and tightness and let it be, relax. And bring up something wholesome. Smile. The more you smile, the more you're apt to have joy arise. Joy is one of the awakening factors, isn't it? It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's really amazing. I mean, I've, I've been in Indonesia and I've given talks to a thousand people at one time. And I, t I say one sentence and they all kind of sit back and go, Really? Meditation, you need to learn how to smile, you need to learn how to have fun, and you need to learn how to laugh with yourself. One sentence. And a thousand people are going, oh, meditation's supposed to be hard. It's not supposed to be fun. Why is meditation fun? Because when you start letting go of the craving, it gets to be super interesting how mind's attention actually does move. It gets to be fun. When you begin to laugh with yourself because your mind is so crazy, it gets carried away with this or that. When you can laugh with yourself for your mind being crazy, welcome to the human race, we're all crazy. It changes your perspective. From, let's say, anger comes up. I'm mad and I don't like this. And then you laugh because you see how ridiculous it is to be angry. And you go from, I'm mad and I don't like it, to oh, it's only this anger. Now, do I want to hang on to this or let it go? And the same person says, let it go. What have you just done? You've changed your perspective from personally taking this feeling 
and making it yours and building on it. And then when you laugh, it changes to, well, it's only this feeling. It's not mine. So you're changing things from the personal perspective to the impersonal perspective. In the Eightfold Path, that is the first fold. Right view. I don't call it right view. I call it harmonious perspective. Because you really get in harmony when you stop identifying with these thoughts and feelings personally. So, the more you can relax, have fun, smile, the more balance you have in your mind. The Buddha didn't teach us that you have to suffer. There is suffering. But that doesn't mean that you have to take it personally. It's just one of those things. Sometimes there's easy days and sometimes there's not. Okay. When you laugh with the hard days, all of a sudden it turns into an easy day. When you laugh at your being attached, what does being attached mean? It means taking things personally and causing your mind to contract and allowing the emotional states to carry you away. But when you laugh, all of a sudden, none of that stuff is so important. It takes an emergency. Oh, I'm bad. This is so hard. And you laugh, and all of a sudden, it's not an emergency anymore. It's nothing to get upset about. This is what equanimity is all about. Learning to have your balanced mind. Not get caught up in your emotional snit, whatever that happens to be. So it's real important to realize how this process works. What happens first? The feeling arises. What happens right after that? I don't like it. What happens right after that? All my thoughts and opinions. The story. And taking that story to mean this is me, I'm right, you're wrong, that's it. Then there is the habitual tendency of the emotions. When you have anger, you wind up saying things that you really wish you hadn't have said later. And what does that do to your body when you have anger? Your body contracts a lot. Your blood pressure goes up. You have, your face can turn actually black from anger. You get, you, you have very unpleasant features. And you act and say things that later you wish you hadn't done or said. Oh, I really regret punching this guy in the face because I was angry. Or whatever. Or I said this and I hurt their feelings. And I didn't really mean it, but I was emotional at the time. Who was? Who didn't have sharp enough mindfulness at that time to let go of this process instead of building on it. Oh, 
Okay. Practice the way of restraint. Guard the eye faculty. Undertake the restraint of the eye faculty. What are we talking about with restraining the eye faculty? Does that mean I can't look at a pretty flower? No. It means when your mind, when your eye hits the color and form, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of these three things is called eye contact. With eye contact as condition, eye feeling arises. That is pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant. When you see a pretty flower, your, your mind says, oh, this is nice. That's a pleasant feeling that's there. And right after that, I like that. That's the beginning of the ego belief, the false ego belief that this is yours personally. And then your concepts and opinions and thoughts about why you like that. And that's where your false ego belief really gets set. And then you have your habitual tendency arising and you have birth of action and you have sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. One of those anyway. <laughs> but when your mindfulness is good, the eye hits color and form, eye, eye consciousness arises. There is eye contact. With eye contact as condition, eye feeling arises. When your mindfulness is good and that feeling is pleasant, you start 6 r right then. Now, there is no craving. And if there's no craving, there's no clinging. And if there's no clinging, there's no habitual tendency. If there's no habitual tendency, there's no action, no birth. If there's no birth, there's no sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, or despair. That's how it works. So how important is it to recognize when cravings begins to arise. Very. How can you recognize it? By that tension and tightness. When you get used to observing that. Important stuff. If the goal of the meditation is to let go of craving. To let go of suffering. Now suffering can be mental and it can be physical. You treat that always in the same way. You use the six R's. Now the standard definition of right effort is this. An unwholesome state arises. What's unwholesome? I am that, whatever it happens to be. You release the unwholesome state and you relax. You bring up a wholesome state, smile, and come back to your object of meditation. You repeat staying with your object of meditation for as long as you can. Not by holding on to it, trying to force it to be there, but by allowing it to be there. It'll stay there for longer periods of time as you 
become more familiar with how the process works. So if you're practicing some form of absorption concentration, what happens? Your mind gets distracted, you let go of the distraction, you immediately come back to your object of meditation. Over a period of time, you have what is called a nimitta. In Pali, that's the word. Nimitta means a sign. That does not happen when you use the relaxed step. It does happen when you start developing your concentration. Your absorption concentration. A nimitta is a sign. It's like a white disc that comes up in your mind. Now, the most people, they say, oh, nimitta, oh, that's really good. You're doing the practice just right. Except you don't have any nimittas come up when you let go of the craving. See, this one little extra step of relaxing changes the entire meditation. It doesn't allow your mind to go so deep that anything is suppressed. So it's real important to, to practice using the six R's every time your mind gets distracted. Now, some people, especially when they first start off in meditation, they will have thoughts arise, but they can stay on the object of meditation. It doesn't pull their attention to those thoughts or feelings. Ignore those. If they're not strong enough to pull your attention away, then just stay with your object of meditation. The only time you use the six R's is when your attention does get pulled away by thoughts or memories or um, daydreaming or whatever it happens to be. If your attention gets pulled away from your object of meditation, that is a distraction. I don't care whether you call the distraction lust or hatred or sloth and torpor or restlessness or doubt. It doesn't matter. It is a distraction. What do you do when a distraction arises? Six R. Now the reason that we use this six R is because it is easy to remember. But you have to understand that the six R's are not something that you have to try to memorize. These words are describing action. What do you do when your mind is distracted? Recognize, release, relax, smile, come back to your object of meditation. Stay there. So it's a kind of a flow. It's things to do, but not things to think about. So it's a rather important aspect of the meditation to be able to recognize that craving. An awful lot of people, when you talk to them about, what is craving? Oh, it's desire. I want this, I want that. No, it's, it's more than that. That's only a surface answer. Just like a lot of the teachers will tell you how important it is to see that everything is impermanent and everything is suffering and everything is not self, although they don't know what not self means, really. Everything is changing all the time. even while you're in the jhana. Everything is changing, and that's fine. 
you go from having joy to having tranquility to having comfort in your mind and your body to having unification in your mind. Your mind, those, these things are changing. They're not always going to be the same. They're not always going to act in exactly the same way. So, when there is an overemphasis on impermanence, then it's an intellectual knowledge without actually seeing and realizing the subtleness of it. And anything that changes is a form of dissatisfaction because it is changing. We have this idea that somewhere we're supposed to be able to see something permanent. And the only thing in this universe that is permanent is change. That's the way it works. Change always happens. I mean, sit still. Don't move. Can you do that? Your heart beats. The earth is spinning. The blood's moving. Sit still. Don't move. Impossible. And you even go deeper. I mean, you go down to atoms and what's happening? Electrons, neutrons are going around, around the atom. You, you can't sit still. It's Nothing in this, per, in this world is permanent. But the thing is, when you start actually seeing it in a deeper way, you start to understand that everything is impermanent, but it's impermanent in an impersonal way. There's nothing personal about this stuff happening. You can't make it start. You can't make it stop. It happens. Okay. But I don't want it to happen. Okay, stop the atoms from moving in your body. Stop the molecules from moving around. Stop your blood from moving. But when it's overemphasized, people have the idea that seeing impermanent suffering and not self is the end goal. And it's not. It happened but there's so much deeper understanding as you start letting go more and more of the craving, of the tensions and tightnesses in your mind and in your body. When Brahman, the monk, guards the doors of his sense faculties, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, be moderate in eating. Reflecting wisely, you should take food neither for amusement nor for intoxication nor for the sake of physical beauty and attractiveness but only for the endurance and continuance of this body, for ending discomfort, and assisting the whole, for assisting the holy life, considering I shall terminate old feelings without arousing new feelings. I shall be healthy and blameless, and live. I shall live in comfort. It's really amazing that an awful lot of people, when they start describing a oh, family reunion, what they generally talk about is, oh, the food was so good. But an awful lot of people actually don't really even taste the food very much because they're thinking if 
about the taste instead of tasting it. And what is thinking about restlessness? Where's my opinions and ideas? Oh, they're there. That's really good stuff. I want some more of that. Now, the Buddha, when he ate, it says in the scriptures that he would take a, some rice in his hand, and maybe he had a curry with it, whatever, and he would put it in his mouth, and he would chew until every grain of rice was chewed before he swallowed. Why would he do something like that? Because that's how you maintain a healthy body. You see a lot of people that are overweight. And when they eat, they chew once, twice, swallow. So they have these big globs in their stomach, and that <coughs> turns to fat. When you're chewing your food, you're mixing saliva with your food. That's the first part of the digestion. So it's easier to digest when you chew your food more. And you fill up faster, and you don't get hungry after that. So I've, I've been well, for the last 15 years, I've been eating one meal a day. Sometimes I get pushed into eating a little bit in the breakfast, but I don't really care to. I do it because out of politeness because they went to the trouble of making it and bringing it and offering it. But I actually prefer not to eat anything in the morning. I eat at lunch. And I'm almost always the last person at the table because I eat slowly. But the digestion is good. I'm reasonably healthy. I haven't had a cold in two years, maybe. So, I don't get headaches. What's this from? From eating moderately and chewing your food. Being mindful about chewing your food. Observing how that works. When monks, the monk is moderate in eating, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, be devoted to wakefulness. During the day, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. Now, what's he telling you here? He's telling you that you need to watch your mind. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Whether you're walking, whether you're sitting, watch what your mind is doing. Stay on your object of meditation. Even if your object of meditation is only smiling. When you smile, you are practicing the entire Eightfold Path at that time. How interesting is that? How many times have you heard that? So, I tell you to smile all the time. Smile during the day as much as you can remember. Why? It's helping you develop the discipline to follow the Eightfold Path. And it can be fun. And even when you don't feel like smiling, especially if you don't feel like smiling, Smile and laugh with yourself for getting so caught up in the nonsense of this monkey mind. Hmm. 
during the day while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. In the first watch of the night, that's from 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. In the middle watch of the night, that's 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock. You should lie down on your right side in the lion's pose with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware after noting your, in your mind the time for arising. Now, you remember I told you one of the things I wanted you to do is make a determination of what time you're going to get up you're learning how to set your body clock. And that's an important thing that help, that gets more important as you go deeper into your meditation. After rising in the third watch of the night, 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the morning, while walking back and forth and sitting, purify your mind of obstructive states. Watch what your mind is doing. Let go of the nonsense stuff that keeps coming in and trying to distract you away from your object of meditation. And like I said, your object of meditation can be just smiling. I've had students that I've told, I don't want you to sit, I don't want you to do anything except smile. And the reason that I'm doing that is because I want to show them up close and personal what mindfulness truly is. When Brahman, a monk, is devoted to wakefulness, then the Tathagata disciplines him further. Come, monk, be possessed of mindfulness and full awareness. Act in full awareness when going forward and returning. Act in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away. Act in full awareness when flexing and extending your limbs. Act in full awareness when wearing your robes and carrying your outer robe and bowl. Act in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food, and tasting. Act in full awareness when defecating and urinating. Act in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Full awareness of what? what mind is doing while you're doing these activities. Oh, but this is supposed to be mindfulness of the body. It is mindfulness of the body. By watching what your mind is doing and relaxing, you're relaxing your body and your mind at the same time. When Brahman the monk possesses mindfulness and full awareness, then the Tathagata di disciplines him further. Come, monk, resort to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. He resorts to a secluded resting place in the forest or heap of straw. On returning from his alms round after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishes mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. 
He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor. Mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied or thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. With the fading away of joy, he abides in equanimity, mindful and fully aware. Still feeling pleasure with the body, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce, he has a pleasant abide. Uh, he has a pleasant abiding who is has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. This is my instruction, Brahman, to those monks who are in the higher training. Higher training in Pali means is Abhidhamma. So we're using it Abhidhamma as higher training through meditation. Whose minds have not yet attained the goal, who abide aspiring to the supreme security from bondage, but these things conduce both to a pleasant abiding here and now and to mindfulness and full awareness for monks who are arahats with taint destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached their own goal, destroyed the, fetter, the ob obstructions, no, distractions, that's the word, of habitual tendencies and are completely liberated through final knowledge. When this was said, the Brahman uh, Ganaka Mogalana asked the Blessed One, when Master Gotama's disciples are thus advised and instructed by him, do they all attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, or do some not attain it? When Brahman, they are thus advised and instructed by me, some of my disciples attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. Master Gotama, since Nibbana exists and the path leading to Nibbana exists, and Master Gotama is present as the guide. What is the cause and reason why? When Master Gotama's disciple are thus advised and instructed by him, 
Some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. As to that, Brahman, I will ask you a question in return. Answer it as you choose. What do you think, Brahman? Are you familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha? Yes, Master Gotama, I am familiar with the road leading to Rajagaha. What do you think, Brahman? Suppose a man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha. Rajagaha, and he approached you and said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. Then he told them, Now, good men, this road goes to Rajagaha. Follow it for a while and you will see a certain village. Go a little further and you'll see a certain town. Go a little further and you will see Rajagaha with its lovely parks, groves, meadows, and ponds. Then having thus advised, having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would take a wrong road and go to the west. Then a second man came who wanted to go to Rajagaha and he approached you and said, Venerable Sir, I want to go to Rajagaha. Show me the road to Rajagaha. Then you told him, Now, good man, this road goes to Rajagaha. Follow it for a while, and you will see Rajagaha with its lovely parks, groves, meadows, and ponds. Then, having been thus advised and instructed by you, he would arrive safely at Rajagaha. Now, Brahman, since Rajagaha exists, the path leading to Rajagaha exists, and you are present as the guide, what is the cause and reason why? When those men who have thus been advised and instructed by you, one man takes a wrong road and goes to the west, and arrives, the other arrives safely in Rajagaha. What can I do about that, Master Gotama? I am the one who shows the way. So too, Brahman. Nibbana exists. The path leading to Nibbana exists. And I am present as the guide. Yet, when my disciples have thus been advised and instructed by me, some of them attain Nibbana, the ultimate goal, and some do not attain it. What can I do about that, Brahman? The Tathagata is the one who shows the way. When this was said, the Brahman Gana Moggallana said to the Blessed One, There are persons who are faithless, and have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, not out of faith, but seeking a livelihood, who are fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, personally vain, rough-tongued, loose-spoken, unguarded in their sense faculties, immoderate in their eating, undevoted to wakefulness, unconcerned with recluseship, not greatly respectful of training, luxurious, careless leaders in backsliding, neglectful of, of seclusion, lazy, wanting in energy, unmindful, not fully aware, uncollected, with straying minds devoted, devoid of wisdom, drivelers. Master Gotama does not dwell together with these. But there are clansmen who have gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, who are not fraudulent, deceitful, treacherous, haughty, hollow, personally vain, rough-tongued, loose-spoken, who are guarded in their sense faculties, moderate in eating, devoted to wakefulness, concerned with recluseship, greatly respectful of training, 
not luxurious or careless, who are keen to avoid backsliding, leaders in seclusion, energetic, resolute, established in mindfulness, fully aware, collected with unified mind, possessing wisdom. Every time you hear the word wisdom, it means the links of dependent origination. That is how you become wise. Not drivelers, Master Gotama dwells together with these. Just as the black orris root is reckoned as the best root perfume, and red sandalwood is reckoned as the best wood perfume, jasmine is reckoned as the best flower perfume, so too Master Gotama's advice is supreme among the teachings of today. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with good eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and the Sangha of monks. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Anytime you hear that final little paragraph, it means that he became a Sotapanna from listening to the Dhamma. He listened with a mind that was attentive. He was interested in every little aspect of the Dhamma. And he understood what was being said. And that's what that means. Okay, guys, you got a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Would, would one know they became a sort of problem? Absolutely. There was definitely some kind of... There's a big feeling of relief. And that relief lasts for a lot of days. And you know that there has been some kind of change in your mind. Well, the word Dhamma has actually two meanings. It's either the teaching of the Buddha or the truth. Not everything is the truth. Because if you take something personally, you are deluded. That is not Dhamma. It's the truth of the present moment. Uh, right, absolutely. Yeah. The more secular Buddhism comes into being, the more these definitions will disappear. It's a really a necessary thing for many people to go back and read the Dhamma. Especially after you've gone and done a retreat and you've gotten to strong equanimity. Then when you read something, you know whether it's right or not because you have the direct experience. So I don't recommend a lot of people to read. 
because you can become so confused with so many strange ideas that you don't know what to believe. You don't know how to practice. So practice first. Go through the jhana. Jhana is a word that is very misunderstood. Almost everybody in this country, when you say the word jhana, they say, oh, concentration. The word jhana does not mean concentration in all aspects. It means a level of understanding. Because when you go from one jhana to the next, the reason that you go is because you are understanding more and more clearly how things actually occur. In other words, you're understanding more and more about the links of dependent origination. And when you have that direct experience, people can come up and they can tell you all kinds of things. You know whether it's right or not. There's no question in your mind. That's why when the Buddha was talking about dependent origination, he did mention that this is the backbone of his teaching. The backbone of the Buddha's teaching is knowing and understanding the links of dependent origination and how they work directly in you. You know and understand and deeply realize the Four Noble Truths. That's another part of the backbone. And the third part of that is, in a very, very deep way, seeing impermanence, suffering, and the impersonal nature of everything. You can't take just one part of that without the other because they all get go together to make up the backbone of the Buddha's teaching. You can't say, well, anicca, dukkha, anatta, that's all I have to understand. No, it's not. You have to understand that each link of dependent origination has the Four Noble Truths in it. And you see for yourself that those links are changing all by themselves. And that is how you see the Anicca Dukkha Nanata, through the links of dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths. And if you don't see that, there is no Nibbana that will occur. It's not some Wowzer, dowser, ooh, I just became enlightened. Well, they might be enlightened, but they're not awake. And that's really what the Buddha was talking about, about being awake. He had been asleep until he realized for himself exactly how these links work. And then his mind became so awake that he could give this truth to other people. I, mean, I, I know that there's some people in, in India that they, they claim to be enlightened teachers. What is enlightenment? I tell you something you don't know. I've enlightened you. Is that the same as being awake? I don't think so. When you're awake, that means there's no sleepiness, there's no dullness in your mind. You see things actually as they occur. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Yeah? Well, the way it works is you have to become familiar with how that process works. 
And at first you're not going to be able to do that. Don't try because you will try too hard and cause yourself to get restless. But as you become more familiar with how this process works, then you'll be able to let go of things more quickly and more easily. And you'll be able to relax more quickly and easily. Of course, when there is mindfulness. But there's danger in, in neither the pleasant or painful. What's the danger? Indifference. Okay? Do you have a pleasant or painful feeling when you see this? Is your mindfulness there to see how your mind's attention moved? Why? You're indifferent to it. That's the danger. When people have strong equanimity, then seeing everything is the same. Anybody else? Let's share some merit then. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sah.